Conflict in interest. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me now? The, the, the goal of or the objective is to apply what we learned, certainly uh, in terms of uh, more recent information on glucose homeostasis in the understanding and management of what the causes are in terms of hypoglycemia, uh, clinical manifestation, and the consequences, and in terms of management. Put it very simply, Glucose homeostasis is a balance between production and utilization. And production is what you produce endogenously uh, from your body reserve, and all of us have plenty of, certainly as adults, and uh, or exogenous, what we take in the, in the case of babies, uh, certainly in neonates, uh, as milk. And utilization is how much expenditure the basal need, these are basal metabolic rate, you need a certain amount of energy just to maintain your cell and your organism function. And stresses, which unfortunately, whether it's due to baby's illness or maternal illness or iatrogenic. And cold stress is a classic example of an unnecessary increase in the needs for the baby that we can prevent. And interposed with that, there's a whole bunch of endocrine and metabolic uh, mechanisms to maintain things in balance. So this is a very simplistic model. And from a fetus perspective, uh, there's the mother and, a, and the fetus, the placenta, all the nutrients, whether it's glucose, amino acid, fatty acid, glycerols, or ketones, uh, goes across bidirectionally. Uh, the classic uh, glucose, uh, uh, glucose homeostatic hormones, uh, in particular insulin and glucagon, uh, each on its own, and they produce their own, and the placenta produces some of the hormone itself. In terms of fetal energy metabolism, glucose is the primary fuel for the fetus. Uh, the fetus can use amino acid, ketone, and lactate, but uh, for practical purpose, glucose is the go-to nutrient. The fetal blood sugar level is about 70, 80% of the maternal blood sugar level. And totally logically, it assumes it helps with the concentration gradient in terms of transfer across. Uh, glycogen stores uh, is, relatively speaking, in absolute quantities, uh, small in the newborn, particularly if you're born premature or if you're born uh, growth retarded. Uh, but on a per unit mass, it is actually a lot more compared to an adult, whether it's at the cardiac level or skeletal, skeletal, skeletal muscle and liver perspective. So in terms of uh, in the, for practical, uh, from a practical aspect, in terms whenever you're going to resuscitate a sick baby, the heart just keep beating on. Uh, it's one of the last to go. And as I mentioned, if you're growth retarded, your glycogen store is very small. But even in a perfectly healthy full-term baby, the glycogen store is very, li very little, and it can be used up within hours after birth. And obviously, if there's other perinatal stress, particularly thermal stress for the baby, it uses up even quicker. To produce glucose, you have to break down glycogen, so that's the process is called glycogenolytic. And gluconeogenic uh, is the production of glucose from other sources uh, other than glucose. In this case, it's primarily 
uh, amino acids uh, and fatty acids. And the order enzymes that are ready for the metabolic pathway is available by the second trimester. So even in the uh, uh, viable, any pre-meat that is potentially viable, yes, they do have the capacity. The extent, obviously, would be different compared to a full-term baby. And that the carbohydrate-regulating hormones, particularly insulin, growth hormone, cortisol, et cetera, they are also available by a second trimester. And the other source of glucose is from body fat. As I said, adults got plenty of it. And, but for babies, when a baby born at 28 weeks gestation, only roughly 1% of body weight is uh, made up of lipid stores. And even a term is somewhere between, around about 15% of body weight is lipids. So if you starve a baby, the baby's not gonna be able to handle it uh, for very long uh, without running into the problems of uh, energy metabolism. So what happened after the baby's born? Well, this is left over from the in utero stage and when the placental supply stop. So the glycogen store lasts for hours, lipid and structural tissue. The body is excellent in catabolizing its own body, but you can't catabolize the only other thing you can catabolize your muscle tissue. So it will last for days, but certainly not gonna last uh, much longer than that if you don't provide any exogenous nutrients. And so the importance about exogenous nutrient is it's better to give the baby complete nutrient rather than glucose. So that's why the baby has milk. And we'll go into a little more detail about that uh, uh, as uh, the presentation goes on. And depending on the extent of stress, whether it's cold stress, respiratory distress, sepsis, uh, they all increase the oxygen consumption and the need for substrates. And uh, to have normal glucose homeostasis, uh, any individual need normal functioning multiple organs. The important ones, liver, muscle, kidney, and cardiorespiratory system. You can't do without the gut in terms of maintaining, maintaining uh, glucose homeostasis. These are the kids with gut disorders, cannot be fair for whatever reason, but it is always nice to have a functioning gut. And uh, as I uh, shown earlier, the normal complex of enzymes and endocrine responses are already available when a baby's born. So in terms of glucose production, this occurs in anybody, regardless of whether you're preemie or an adult. And the primary source is glycogen, and in older kids and adults, muscle provides gluconeogenic uh, substrates. Uh, primarily alanine uh, and also uh, lactate pyruvate. And fat breaks down gl uh, glycerol and they all form glucose uh, in the liver. And when you go to utilization, the most important one is the brain in terms of glucose uh, metabolism, and obviously the other organs and tissues, including fat, also need uh, uh, the glucose in terms of metabolism, although its contribution to glucose homeostasis more as a store rather than as uh, a consumer. And the hormonal control, there are a number of hormones important for gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, and these are important in terms of function. Glycogen storage disease are the kids that can deposit glycogen in the liver but can't release the glycogen. That's why they run in hyperglycemia, et cetera. And utilization, insulin, their insulin is important in term, particularly in terms of peripheral tissue uptake. Whereas the brain, you can have the uptake utilization with or without insulin receptors. So this is just a cartoon of what happened at birth in the first few hours. The catecholamine is extremely high around about the, uh, uh, soon after the baby's delivered, and then it comes down over the next number of hours, glucagon goes up. Insulin is relatively high, and if things settle down, it gradually goes down. But if you give any time a glucose challenge or nutritional intake, 
insulin do go up in postnatally. This is the baby without being fed. Now, for those of you in, it looks like there's some medical student in residency too, and this is a metabolic pathway that, uh, at least when I went through medical school, I wasn't sure why do I have to remember this, and what little I remember, I've forgotten. But nevertheless, it's important. And part of that, this is basically show you that the glycogen is related to galactose and glucose, so it forms there and it breaks down uh, when you need it. And fructose uh, and multiple amino acids uh, from protein source and triglyceride from the fat store all go in the metabolic pathway in terms of formation and breakdown of glycogen and in terms of the TCA cycle. And that if you count up the number of enzymes, there's at least 16 different enzymes have been described as deficient, sufficient, mutation. So there are a lot of potential area that can go wrong, but in terms of glucose homeostasis, you can have glycogen, you can have fat, and fat also give you ketones, and also in terms of various proteins, and also lactate and pyruvate that can, these are interconvertible, and it, from there it goes into the TCA cycle. This is another way of looking at it. the previous slide, and show you a couple of amino acids, and here, it basically, what this slide is showing you is almost every amino acid, whether it's essential amino acid or non-essential amino acid, can all go into energy metabolism. And so when the body, when you're starved, you run out of glycogen, uh, before you run out of fat, your body, your endocrine and metabolic response start to catabolize your muscle. And that's why muscle wasting, especially in age, but that's a different mechanism, or in disease state, it's bad for you. So there's carbohydrate, fat, and protein, and ketones, and the lactate and pyruvate are important in terms of energy metabolism. Transport is important. If you look at transporting a carnitine across, try to bring the fatty acid, the C CPTA, and the CPT2, the transport across the mitochondria, and to go into, so the fatty acid can go into the beta oxidation cycle, and also formation of ketones. Uh, acetoacetate and beta hydroxy uh, butyrate, and part of it can go in TCA cycle, part of formation of that. Uh, fetus have been demonstrated even in the second trimester can use, the, the brain can use the ketone bodies. And these are human fetuses. So basically, glucose can go into anabolic and, and aerobic uh, uh, pathways to produce energy, but there are various sources that can produce glucose or go into uh, the energy metabolism. And this is the fat, this is the ketogenic and glucogenic uh, amino acids. So that's a fat transport. Glucose transporter is also important. There are 12 intramembrane uh, uh, portions in the uh, the glucose transporter family. There's at least seven glucose transporter now, and glucose, the GLUT2 is primarily responsible for glucose transport in the brain and in, in the intestine. And these are the facilitated, the GLUT uh, glucose uh, transporters, but there's also sodium dependent transporters, and if you see an avatars on television, you can buy commercially available, the glucose, sodium glucose uh, block at the kidney level, so you pee out more glucose to help your sugar control, but then there's whole different lot of side effects, etc. with that. And they all got similar trans uh, uh, structural motif with transmembrane domains. So we're talking about the substrate, we're talking about the transport, and we can tie in the metabolic with the endocrine. This is the control of beta cell. This is an old slide that I draw 
over 10 years ago, <laughs> and it's still applicable, is in terms of the two key uh, mutations or changes. In fact, there are now over 200 mutations in the so-called uh, potassium KATP channel and also the voltage gate, the calcium channel. And these two uh, channels are critical to the release of insulin. And as time goes on, we now we know this is the so-called triggering, and with the metabolism, their so-called amplification pathway. And of this, it's now this obviously importance in terms of glu the glucose transport into the beta cell, a G protein coupled receptors, and now in 2016, <laughs> it's getting more and more complicated, but the principle remains the same. These are what we call, or some people call it chenopathies. These are channels that release the potassium and allow the calcium entry to control the insulin secretion. Whereas the, the starter, this is the triggering one, and the amplification, they all center around the production ATP and the various influences. And they are also so-called uh, a, a gatekeeper or non-functioning or minimize the functioning. Otherwise, you're going to have so much pyruvate goes in. So there are natural mechanisms in terms of metabolism, and these are called metabolopathies. And these highlighted uh, in bold are the 11 genes that so far have been described. And for those, and that's associated with hyperinsulinemia. And some of these mutations depends on active or inactivating mutations can be associated with uh, MODI, which is juvenile onset diabetes and later onset of diabetes. And this is when I wish I had learned a bit more biochemistry. And in addition, we now know more and more uh, in cretins, these are the gut hormones that stimulate insulin secretion, and uh, the GLP, glycogen like protein, uh, uh, one receptors are important, and there are medications now to actually block this and or increase the, uh, uh, the incretence and increase the insulin secretion for the control of glucose for obesity, etc. So even though we're talking about hypoglycemia, but the principle applies either way in terms of ultimately affecting the insulin. So we talk about the substrate, we talk about the transporter, we talk about the metabolism, we talk about the control of insulin secretion. So there are, based on what you've seen, or, or what I presented, there are numerous have a physiologic basis for neonatal hypoglycemia, and including iatrogenic causes, which I, I'll come back to uh, as we go along. So based on that, and I don't expect, and I certainly don't remember, this long laundry list of potential causes. By the way, this is an incomplete list. But in terms of someone with hypoglycemia, they could be either asymptomatic or symptomatic. And it could be transient or uh, persistent and recurrent. And specific etiology, if you look at by group, it's too much insulin, there's problem endocrine disorder, problem with hereditary defects and metabolism, you saw that at least 16, 18 different mutations or changes ha have been described in terms of defects in metabolism and amino acid and fatty acid metabolism, as you can see. So that's why with an understanding the basic physiology, and, and no one to my knowledge would remember the whole list, but you can go back to the first principles and try and figure out. And other neonatal uh, problem, iatrogenic miscellaneous, I'll go to that a bit more later on. And this is just, uh, uh, as I said, that's, this is an older slide, there's at least 11. Of the 11 genes that's important, there are over 200 mutations just in the two 
uh, potassium and calcium channel mutations been described. So the knowledge is improved at a pace that uh, one, I, I certainly can't keep up with it. This took me <laughs> days and days to prepare. Uh, so what happened to the normal baby? Because this is overwhelming majority of baby that we see. And as a resident, this is also the overwhelming majority of time you get called saying, hey, this kid's dextrous sticks is low. And my very first one that I never forget is a nurse called me, and I was trained in a different country. I was at a level uh, like a junior fellow counterpart. And this nurse said, oh, I can't get any glucose on this kid. So I said to her, I said, have you repeated? She said, yep, three times. So if any nurse tells you they've done more than once, you believe them. So I went there. I was trained in the days where the nurses don't put you in IV. The resident have to do that. And I was also trained when you do a dextrous stick, you need to collect a blood sample for, uh, for the lab to confirm it because you can't trust the dextrous. The kid looks great, was screaming, he set off. I stuck a needle in, got the blood out, collect the blood, and the kid stopped crying. And the heart rate went boop, <laughs> boop. Whoa, I thought, oh, this is real. Squirt in, and in those days, we were using D25. That's how long ago it was. And jump on the chest, the kid started to cry again. Once you've seen a severe Hypo, symptomatic hypoglycemia, you'll never forget it because this is potentially life-threatening. And so we'll come to the management later on in terms of severe hypoglycemia. But for normal babies, this is a cartoon of the hormone that I show in terms of catecholamine, glucagon, insulin. The glucose for, the, for all babies tend to drop in the first hour or two. And then it gradually creeps up. And this, these are the kids that without being fed and free fatty acid go up, what that basically is saying, the body is breaking up whatever fat storage the baby has, the glycogen is basically being depleted over the first few hours. And depends on how far back you start training, there were a period that people don't feed the babies for days and then for half a day and then for hours. Now, as soon as they delivered, after you delay cork clamping, you put on baby's chest, uh, put the baby on mom's chest, and the baby will start to having rooting reflex and start suckling. That's all been encouraged. That's the current standard recommendation. Based on a good number of studies, primarily cross-sectional, this is one of the frequently illustrated one, and I already made this slide, so I wasn't going to change it. Uh, what happened is these are the so-called full-term healthy baby with the birth weight two and a half kilogram to four kilogram. Now two and a half kilogram for a full-term baby tend to be a little on the small side, but by definition, low birth weight is less than two and a half kilogram. So this is so-called normal weight. And these are the babies that's fed within four hours after they're born. And these numbers are the numbers of samples they take at each time. This is the first six hours, 12 to 24 hours, one to two days, and so on, so forth. Now for these so-called healthy babies, this is two standard deviations. So that's 97 and a half percentile, and that's two and a half percentile. So you said to yourself, boy, this, this healthy kid got awfully high sugar. Can someone tell me why that's the case, and that's not an infant diabetic mother. Mums have IV glucose before C-section, and you get a lot of babies have high sugar when they come out. And, but they otherwise, well, there are plenty of elective C-section gets that. And the low ones is pretty respectable. The mean is around about 100, and it drops pretty precipitously to the mean around about 50. And then, Within hours and a little bit of feeding, it creep out a little bit and bounces around somewhere between 50 and 70. 
and for the first two to three days, and then after three days or so, it tend to drift up a little more to about 70. So that's the mean value. And if you keep that in mind, you can understand why two different society, American Academy of Pediatrics and Pediatric Endocrine Society, give you two different recommendations. So anyway, this is the mean. The other important thing other than these outliers up here is this spot. Within the first couple of hours in the so-called normal babies, their sugar can dip as low as in high 20s, low 30s. So this is the kind, and, and there are a number of other publications that is similar to this. So these are the kind of things you keep in mind. This is what so-called normal healthy babies do. Now, when we talk about glucose, we hear about blood glucose, plasma glucose, serum glucose. It is important for us to be consistent. And for the heel sticks that we, we're supposed to do arterialized capillary, because for those of you who's been in the nursery, you see the nurses wrap the heel in a warm pad, it warms the blood up, so instead of having a static capillary there, you increase the flow, so it's arterialized. When we send the labs to the lab, we always stick the vein, or we usually stick the vein. And so if you measure the blood, the glucose in the capillary is higher than the venous. In the arterial blood, arterialized, supposed to be the same as artery, is higher than venous blood. And venous blood, and we normally take a peripheral vein, but if you take it from a central vein, it would be even lower because it depends on which organ it comes from. And if you look at plasma and serum glucose, which is usually the lab provider value, and this should be the glucose for which we base our diagnosis on, is somewhere between 10, 15% higher than the venous level, right? Because of the red cell volume, et cetera. So let's try to keep that in mind. This is the kind of thing that we need to remember. And if you delay the measurement, especially for the lab, now currently in the bad old days, we used to stick the heel and put on this strip with glucose oxidase on and you have a little color pattern and compare the two. That is, relatively speaking, very inaccurate. It gives you a very rough screen. The current instrument that you see the nurses do, they scan them so they can bill them, or the lab can bill them. They stuck a tube in and put a drop of blood, and that is far more sensitive, but it's still not as accurate as the lab. The problem in the lab is if you send a blood sample, as for example, that little baby that I had, if I send it to the lab and it sits on a bench for the next three hours, you can guarantee that sugar is going to be lower than it actually value is because red cell can chew up anywhere between, actually in some studies a little lower than that, somewhere between 10 to 20 milligram per deciliter per hour. So if you sit there, and so if the baby wasn't hypoglycemic, if you sit on the bench for the next two hours, it's gonna be hypoglycemic for you. The white cells bacteria can also chew up uh, glucose in your sample. And the gluco glucose oxidase is the commonest methodology in terms of measuring glucose. It can be falsely high or falsely low, depending on is there any contaminant or uh, are there other issues in the blood sample. And generally, and this again, as I said, this slide was prepared about a decade ago, but in general, this still holds. If you have a very low or very high glucose, you need to confirm it. It's like the transcutaneous, although very high, you know it's high. The transcutaneous bilirubin, very low, you're really not going to worry about it because your eyeball is going to help you. So it is useful, but if in terms of confirming hypoglycemia, you have to do that. So what is hypoglycemia? Well, People have used statistical definition, two standard deviation below the mean in apparently normal infant, like the pre one of the previous slides I show you. But these value varies depending on gestational age, birth weight, and whether the baby is appropriately grown or very large or very small, 
and the kind of nutrition support, whether they've been fed in the first four, four hours, in the first hour, or haven't been fed for eight or 12 hours, and physical activity. Fetal glucose equivalent, and they can use that as a definition. So if you say, okay, this is what the baby had experienced in neutro, so how do I define hypoglycemia after the baby's born? So certainly in the first hour, you can say, well, I can use fetal glucose equivalent. So what you're looking then, you look for the lowest maternal glucose minus 15 to 30%, because the baby's around about 70, 80% of the maternal level. And, and that work out for plasma glucose, roughly 40, 50 milligram per deciliter. For term infants, if they fed within four hours, the plasma glucose, that low limit of 95% confidence in, in the ball, in other words, the lowest 2.5%, it should be, the mean should be more than 40 milligram by four hours, 45 by 24, 50 by 72 hours. But at least 10% of the babies have one value less than 35 milligram per deciliter during the first few hours after baby's born. So these are a definition of hypoglycemia. So you can say, well, if the kid's perfectly fine, who cares? Uh, so that's one approach because you say, well, you've got to have cutoff somewhere. The other way to look at the final hypoglycemia is function. So if the baby's twitching away, seizing, and the sugar's less than 25, and you confirm that's low. In the meantime, you get the baby a bolus of glucose, the sugar came out, baby symptom resolve. That, by definition, is hypoglycemia. And usually, these are all reports. Usually, the symptoms don't occur until the baby's less than 25 milligram per deciliter. Uh, by the way, if you read any other literature other than U.S., if SI, SI unit is 18 milligram per deciliter equal to one millimole, so this is uh, uh, roughly one and a half millimole. And for adults, however, around about 50 milligram, you start in symptomatology. And if you give um, a glucose, whether it's through the mouth, and or IV, once you raise about 60 or more, the symptoms resolve. And these are fairly well established. Most people agree, although there's no reason why baby can't seize when the sugar's 30, because there are some individual variation in terms of tolerance or threshold. And in neonates, at least, it's been demonstrated when the kids become hypoglycemic, they do have a compensatory mechanism by increased cerebral blood flow. So that even though your concentration low, but if your cerebral blood flow increases, or if your tissue extraction glucose increases, it still compensates at lower uh, plasma or blood glucose levels. Or neurophysiologic function, and that's certainly been demonstrated in neonates. And 47 is little over two millimole per deciliter. That's been described in case, lots and lots of case reports. What they look at is look at brainstem, auditory evoked potential, or somatosensory uh, uh, evoked potential. These are the stimulants, whether it's to sound or to movement, uh, or a vision, a visual evoked potential, or EEG. The latency and variability changes when your sugar is a little high. Now, these are symptomatic, and these may or may not be symptomatic, but certainly they are phys demonstration of abnormal physiologic function. As I mentioned, uh, there's possibly maybe increased compensatory mechanism where there's blood flow, or some people say, well, breastfeeders can tolerate uh, lower blood glucose because the ketone level is a little higher. Now, I, yeah, I, I'm aware of a number of case reports documenting that, but I'm not totally convinced that's the case because the breastfeeding baby, if they grow normally, should not be any different from any other baby. So whether you're breastfeed or bottle feed, you should start with the same amount of ketones. Anyway, if you take an older child or adult, 
just like symptomatology, they are they have new neurophysiologic functional disturbance. Around about 55, maybe a little more, and the first sign is decreased brain glucose utilization. These are easily demonstrable in adults. And stable isotopes being used for these. Or perhaps even more important developmentally, what happens if you have hypoglycemia, particularly if it's persistent, recurrent, and severe? Well, their head don't grow, they get microcephalic. Two, they have delayed uh, uh, neurodevelopment, the IQs shot, and it's usually from delayed diagnosis and delayed appropriate management, and sometimes iatrogenically inappropriate management of hyperinsulinism, glycogen storage disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the problem here is we don't know how severe, now severe even one time, less than 25 milligram per deciliter, I'm not aware a single episode causes long-term neurodevelopment problem. And certainly for the transient hypoglycemia, uh, it's certainly AAP uh, believes, and, and there's nothing in the literature supports the transient, a brief hypoglycemia causes any long-term problem. They may have some functional issue for short term. But the problem here is what people don't know is how severe it has to be for how long and how often before it causes that. This is where it leads the AAP and the PES to say, okay, if we don't have an absolute number, you can call it hypoglycemia. What we should do is have a treatment goal or have the screening goal and a treatment goal. So in terms of signs and symptoms, they're usually associated for certainly in neonates and infants, cardiorespiratory apnea, cyanosis, tachypnea, bradycardia, and there's certainly case reports of cardiomegaly associated with hypoglycemia you give, and heart failure, and you give glucose, they get better. Uh, temporary instability, refusal to feed, the CNS issue, lethargy, apathy, sleepiness, or vice versa, that you're jumpy and perhaps even have seizures. And, uh, and skeletal-wise, you need to be floppy or twitches away with myoclonic jerks. Now, the problem with that is none of these are absolutely specific because there are a lot of other things can give you the same signs and symptoms. But nevertheless, these are commonly described and if you confirm that is due to hypoglycemia, then you obviously need to have symptomatology that I described previous slide. You need a confirmation with lab-based plasma glucose assay to say it's indeed in the low range. And then what's even more important is your resolution of symptoms after you give the baby uh, correct the low uh, sugar. Oops. However, if you give the baby glucose with the sugar slow, you raise the sugar, baby still have the same symptom. You better start look elsewhere because these are symptoms. These baby could have calcium problem, magnesium problem, sepsis, asphyxia, etc. So how do you manage? Well, now that we don't have an absolute number, and obviously we're concerned if the blood glucose or plasma glucose is very low. So the AAP and the PES, and, and as a clinician like us, we take a pragmatic approach. So basically, whenever someone's so-called hypoglycemia, you want to know whether they have symptoms or no symptoms. If they have symptoms, it's obviously a lot more urgent in terms of management. And if they're asymptomatic, and particularly if it's transient, then it doesn't mean you shouldn't treat because at any time, they can convert from asymptomatic to symptomatic. But the pressure is a little different. And obviously, it depends on individual threshold, the level at which you manifest your symptom, and the extent to which the body can compensate. And also, in terms of where we start feeding them. Whether these low glucose uh, values are transient or recurrent persistent. And also, as a 
clinical management perspective and certainly from a recommendation from any scientific society or organization, you want to avoid overscreening of healthy kids. But at the same time, you don't want to send kids home. Now, once upon a time, kids stay with their mom for seven days, and then five days, and then three days, and then two days. And currently, they still stay with mom somewhere between 36 and 48 hours. In a lot of places, they even send them home after 24 hours. So you don't want to send too many baby. In fact, you should, ideally, you shouldn't send any baby home with glucose regulatory problems because they'll end up, that's when they end up seizing with symptomatic presentation with the risk of long-term developmental problems. So get the easy ones out of the way. Transient hypoglycemia is primarily due to decreased supply or increased needs, as we talked about earlier, or auto metabolism. These are transient alteration metabolisms. If they hypoxic, you make them better oxygenated. Sepsis, you treat the sepsis, they're cold, you warm them up. That, these things are manageable. However, there's a big part of babies with transient hyperinsulinism, the classic one is IDM. Now, a lot of places, and the AAP start to back off, and certainly, I think three or four years ago, I saw this huge uh, series of LGA. They have some sort, uh, I can't remember where they got the database from, 4,000 LGA babies without, those without they don't belong to IDM just because you're LGA. LGA per se does not cause or related to hypoglycemia. And refroblastosis, vitalis, uh, polycythemia, etc. They do, they are predisposed to hypoglycemia and often by hyperinsulinemia. Uh, maternal oral hypoglycemic, what happens is that squeezes more insulin. The oral hypoglycemic gets across the baby. That can squeeze out the insulin too. And all babies, including small for gestational age and preemie, they have lower glucose threshold before, uh, to suppress insulin. In an adult or older children, around about 60, there's no more insulin. Whereas the baby is small for days at 40, they can still have insulin. So whenever the baby's hypoglycemic, and particularly they symptomatic, you take a critical sample to document the low glucose with measurement of insulin. Any so-called insulin within normal range in the baby's hypoglycemic, this baby has hyperinsulinism because it shouldn't be there. So who to screen? AAP essentially put in these four groups and they are hedging now on LGA without history IDM. Uh, although sometimes uh, IDM history is like coronary amenitis, can be a little grayish rather than real. Or if they add increased risk for persistent hypoglycemia. These are the post-term babies uh, family history, genetic form, the family will tell you, my babies, my other, other two kids have sugar problem early on until they fix the surgery, whatever. And then, or if they have certain syndrome, the classic one is probably Willy, uh, 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 Big Whip Wiedemann syndrome. And this has a gene on chromosome 11, and the chenopathies have gene mutations uh, a genes locate on that. As I said, there's two couple of hundred mutations already been described. Uh, or if they got abnormal physical features, particularly if they have midline facial deformity, these are the kids that you're worrying about with their hyperpituitary, hyperadrenal problem. Or if they got Marco Fellow, same thing with a hypopit. Or if they severely perinatal stress and they need a lot of resuscitation during delivery. And one of the classic thing when you do your NRP is look at the sugar after your resuscitation. And if they have other problems, as we mentioned early on, or symptomatic infants suspect to be hypoglycemic, then you want to check that sugar. So what do we do? OK, this is AAP recommendation. I'm not very good at following tables. And because you've got birth four hours, four to 24 hours, you give IV, you don't give IV, you feed, you don't feed. 
I just, it's like group B strip. I just ask the resident, I stop thinking, just kind of follow that table. Because it, it's difficult in terms of doing this. But nevertheless, they give you some guidance. However, the Pediatric Endocrine Society in asymptomatic just simplified the previous table to this. During the first four hours, as long as these babies are otherwise okay and able to feed, what AAP recommends the minimum plasma glucose of 25 milligrams. So even 25 to 35, it's okay, you feed them again. But if you, anytime you have two samples of 25, in other words, 25, you feed, you check it out, if it's 25, they suggest you ought to give IV. Uh, otherwise, you feed them. And if you feed them regularly, they should come good. And most of them do come good. And four to 24 hours, the, the, uh, the treatment threshold is 35 milligram below which per deciliter, if you have two consecutive one an hour apart after fee, then uh, you ought to give IV and raise it. And 24 hours or more is around about uh, 45. That's what they recommended. And they didn't go beyond, in fact, they didn't go beyond 24 because most kids have gone home by then. Whereas PES, they say, okay, everybody needs to be 50. And for those who's more than 48 hours, need to be 60. And these are asymptomatic babies. But if you're symptomatic, what AAP suggests is, especially if your sugar's low, you're symptomatic, your IV, you want to maintain it between 40 and 50. Uh, PES suggests that you ought to leave at 70. Well, to reconcile these two, what AAP is doing by doing following this, because there's, there's lots of precedence in terms of documentation. This is the so-called normal pattern. Because if you don't follow that, you're going to have 15% of your baby keep getting the sticks in the heels and various things. And also, the other thing is, if you do that, one of the things you're going to take the baby away from the mother and in terms of breastfeeding, we want every baby to breastfeed if possible. So you're now adding another anxiety to the mom. If mom's a first time mom, even experienced mom when you have a new baby, sometimes there are issues in terms of feeding. You can guarantee the breastfeeding rate and the breastfeeding duration is going to drop if you start raising the bar high. So I think this is more or less what AAP is doing. They also look at the so-called bottom three, five percentile as the norm. Whereas the PES, they use the physiologic function basis. Even though there's no obvious long-term sequelae, they feel it's probably safer using the mean value. Remember the curve I said, remember the mean value. They use that as one criteria. And unfortunately, they don't have any data on neonates, and all these data are based on older children and adults in terms of physiologic function. But be that as it may, what AAP does in many ways, it's, it, 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 how shall I put it? It does recognize the reality of breastfeeding, short hospital stay, etc. You know, I think they both have something go for them, but in any case, what you have to do is remember these kind of things, not in terms of every item, but in terms of, okay, are they symptomatic or not symptomatic? Is that gonna linger on? That's the other thing. The AAP say, hey, you got two, two values, one hour apart is still low, you do something about it. And your job, my job, is to minimize the iatrogenic problems. So, what the AAP recommended, and, and certainly PES, was certainly using the criteria even higher. If symptomatic and, and plasma glucose less than 40, you give them IV glucose. So, how did we um, come to the acute treatment? I think everyone would agree in neonates, certainly in the first couple of days, the normal plasma glucose would be 60 to 90. 
and you work on the base of normal, normal body glucose utilization, the glucose space, and the priming dose, and if you look, follow the calculation, the bottom line is this is how you get the two mils per kilo D10W. And uh, so instead of saying, okay, raw memory, trying to remember about 200 milligram per kilo, or two <coughs> mils per kilo D10W, this is how you arrive at that. When you give a bolus, what happens is within a minute or so, the blood glucose shut up pretty quick. And then, and then followed by infusion, it remains stable. Whereas if you give the baby a neonate an infusion without giving them bolus, yes, it will take an extra few minutes. It takes about five minutes to get to certainly within two to three minutes, get you above 30, 35, and within five minutes, get you about 40, and gradually goes up. And the mean certainly meets uh, within half an hour and uh, uh, an hour or so. Uh, but Particularly if symptomatic, you can give a bolus followed by infusion, or if you just want to give infusion, you should be able to get it up uh, within a reasonable period of time. In this case, 10, 20 minutes, it should be there. Okay, use the gut. That'll apply to anything uh, in terms of nutrition support. It sure be less stress and pain for the baby because if you stick an IV in a baby, it may not be the first time. It may be second or third time before you get a yin. And then the IV might pack up within hours, you'd be on a second IV. You start milk, preferably not sugar water. Uh, if you start feeding them, if at all possible, because there are some kids just not ready to be fed for other medical reasons. Okay, does anyone the resident or student know the difference between milk versus D10W in terms of would you prefer to have one mil, one cc of milk or one cc of D10W in terms of nutrient density? All right, I have about one cc of milk and one cc of parental nutrition, including lipids, in standard two gram per kilo per day. In terms of proportion, one cc of milk is equal to two cc's of D10W, and equal about 1.5, 1.7 cc of D10W with amino acid with lipids. So the milk wins hands down in terms of volume and nutrient density. The second benefit of milk is, remember, you have glucose and leucine. These are two primary things that stimulate the beta cell insulin secretion, fatty acid don't even come into it. Whereas milk, glucose, you only have glucose. Parental nutrition is the second best. You have protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Whereas the milk, it's got higher nutrient density. It gives you different sources, absorb, digest and absorb somewhat different rate. So it gives you a steady supply of glucose substrate right throughout. So always feed them if you can. And, uh, uh, and when you feed them, feed them regularly in the balls. Uh, particularly formula fed babies, don't let them drink what they want because it's now documented that the babies are very responsive. The insulin secretion is very good. So if you let them drink what they want, yeah, one feed, they do great. They fix up their sugar. The problem is that start to drive your insulin secretion. And so that you end up chasing your tail in terms of glucose. So if you give them regular intervals, regular, it's particularly in formula fed. Now for breastfeed, you can't restrict how much volume they take. But in the first couple of days, they don't take much. And uh, so you want a regular interval, a fixed volume. And don't expect them to drink 50 cc. Ain't going to happen. And the real breastfeeding baby don't have that either. 15, 20 cc is plenty. You see, and if the baby want a little more, fine. You see how they respond to the feeding in terms of blood glucose or plasma glucose. And don't be afraid to gavage them because if you want a steady substrate supply, you can't expect the baby to drink 5cc one feed, 25, 5, 50, and then 10. 
Ishin Shalom would be like this, his sugar would be like this. So if they, you say, okay, give him 15 cc, what he doesn't drink, pour down the tube. And you can combine the IV as a total floor goal. And whenever you increase the feeds, as the baby gets older, you decrease the IV. Remember, one cc of milk is equal to two cc D10W. It starts to decrease correspondingly. Then you don't have to worry about lala fluid. Uh, that's hypotonic. These kids get hyponatremia. What happened to the baby needing more support, more IV, more glucose? If the baby needs more than about 20 milligram per kilogram per minute of glucose, IV glucose, remember 100 mils per kilo per day give you about 7 milligrams. So that's 300 mils per kilo per day D10W. By then, these babies are already on D12 and half, D15, occasionally D17 and half. And look for iatrogenic problems, especially secondary hyperinsulinemia, hyponatremia. If you're going to give them 200 mils of D10W, they're going to get hyponatremia. And if the hypoglycemia predisposes to heart failure, your heart failure will get worse. So you don't want to give them an unregulated intake in terms of volume. You don't want to set too high a glucose goal. So 50 to 70 milligram per deciliter is plenty good enough and that if the bolus give you too much fluctuation, think about continuous feeding because glycogen storage disease, especially at night time, this is how you treat and prevent hypoglycemia. And if you need to do it, then now once you get to that level, you say, hey, there's something else going on. I need to look a bit more. And you also, one, look for causes of persistent hypoglycemia and consider pharmacotherapy. And if the baby getting that much glucose, still getting uh, hypoglycemia, when the sugar's low, that's the time for your critical sample. You take it, the ones that highlight in yellow are an absolute must, and then talk about, uh, and the rest are just basically bonus. So if you're not sure what to do, do the insulin, glucose, fatty acid, ketone, lactate, and a pH or bicarb. You collect extra three cc's of blood, or three to five cc's of blood in a green top tube, tell them to spin it down. They freeze the plasma and freeze the clot because they might be able to get some cells out of that to look for things down the road. And then if you can get some urine, fine. If you don't, it's not absolutely critical. And then beyond that, you might think about response to glucagon, fasting challenge, or pre-op localization. And when to ask for help, you ask for help anytime you feel you're over your head. Uh, and even the endocrinologist might have to go and look up the whole list, but at least they have the concept of when to manage. And for those few basic things, you can rule out, even though I show you lots of slides, you can rule out majority of diseases by doing that, looking at the acid base status, looking at the presence or absence of ketone, and the extent of fatty acid and lactate, so it tells you where your problems lie. These are the parts that you go and chase after once you have some ideas here. And pharmacotherapy, the four drugs that, there are lots of other drugs you use, but the four drugs, the first line should be diazoxide. That might only work for about 60, 70% of hyperinsulinemia, but that's the first line. It's like treating the cause. Somatostatin analog is number two, you might try glucagon. It used to be said, small for days, they don't respond to glucagon. They do. And partly, they counteract the insulin. Corticosteroid, steroid, uh, unfortunately, has been used for a long time and still been used. And this should be avoided because, one, it doesn't treat the commonest cause of transient and persistent hypoglycemia, which is hyperinsulinemia. It works by tissue catabolism, decreased peripheral glucose intake, so you starve the periphery, drive the blood glucose up to feed the brain, and steroids can also raise blood pressure, even in babies. So there's really no good reason to use steroids. Okay, pharmacotherapy. Side effect of one of the common pharmacotherapy. Anybody know? Hypertrichosis with diazoxide. And there are other. Now, this kid might look a little hairy, but he doesn't, he didn't take uh, diazoxide. And this is a scan 
looking at localized or diffuse. This is the pancreas. This is kidney. The reason the kidney light up is because uh, the PET scan, uh, the radioactive uh, stuff goes through there too. And so the take home message, diagnosis, you need to be aware hypoglycemia can cause short-term and long-term problems. Sometimes history and physical exam give you an idea, history of family history, etc. If the kid with big Wiedemann syndrome, with big fat lips, and, and, and there are physical features, even Turner's can give you hypoglycemia, it raises your suspicion. Critical sample, if you need to go beyond, you keep escalating, you need to get that blood sample for those few simple things I said before treatment. That would certainly help whoever's going to help you manage. For long-term, endocrinologists need to be involved. You really need to get that critical sample. In terms of treatment, if you're in hospital, IV glucose bolus by infusion if they're symptomatic. And in, if you're in the office, if you have a infant, you can have dextrose gel, dextrose gel. And for that older newborn period, uh, glucagon should work by then. They should have had a good few feeds. And you can start feeds if possible and you really want to avoid overdoing things. Thank you. Any questions? Questions, comments? Dr. Brock? That was a good overview of uh, Winston. From my experience, I'll share a few practical things. When I walked in, I was seeing it on my endocrinology colleagues here because Bob and I agree on this is that remember the nurses are always doing dextrous things. Dextrous things with invented or dull diabetics to screen blood sugars less than 80 milligrams. So you've got a baby you're doing dextrous things is less than 40, 45, 50. Again, there are different numbers, uh, the most currently accepted in our field, as I said, is plasma. The keyword there is plasma glucose less than 40 milligrams or at the end of the society says depending on the age because the nap is one to two hours less than 50 in a case of dramatic if it's symptomatic less than 40 milligrams uh, so that's again how you, those are transient most of those kids do well you just feed them every hour or two they will be fine that's never a problem the problem is i have is that if you have a dexter six when we come to make rounds in the morning we see somebody's giving them iv glucose no if your kid's got a low dextrose stage, you must draw a blood sugar. And as Winston very nicely pointed out, that the true glucose oxidase method in the lab is unreliable if it sits, the red cells are consuming glucose for its metabolism. So it's unreliable after even half an hour, leave alone one to two hours, which you can do. So that's something I remember. When you send the lab, tell the lab, I want the results back. So if you've got two consecutive sugar, less than those numbers, those are the kids you treat and it's nicely pointed out. If oral first, if oral doesn't, then only if I don't Second point I would reiterate what Winston said is we've had babies transferred to us from other hospitals. Several of them are your patients, right? But they've been treating and going up and up on the glucose. Is that as you again made the point that you want to do all the laps with the lowest blood sugar, especially ACTH stimulation, uh, uh, pituitary hormones, cortisol, all those because if it's once the sugar comes to normal, none of those endocrine results are allowed. In my experience, the one the commonest conditions you miss are galactosemia, uh, you can miss hypopituitarism because the baby's otherwise is fine, until he becomes one or two years old, when the growth starts uh, dropping, or you can miss uh, certain uh, rare metabolic disorders I've seen, whether it's uh, uh, metabolic acidemia or one of the other ones. And as you again correctly pointed out, the three tests I always do, do a blue sugar, do ammonia, do a lactic acid, and do a ketone. If they are normal, you are not dealing 99.9, you are not dealing with metabolic disorders. Love your comments as an endocrinologist on that. I, I want to thank Dr. Kufo, it's wonderful. And uh, reports about the issue. Actually, as an endocrinologist, I think I want to uh, uh, emphasize the importance of that 
critical sample, when the blood sugar is low, you want to look at all the other metabolites, hormones uh, at, at the same time. Uh, and that, that will give us the basic differential diagnosis. And of course, a good history, and uh, maternal history, prenatal history, natal history, those also help us. And then a good physical exam, That uh, all of this is a, it's going to be a complete evaluation. Um, one other thing is that you made a point about that, and I want to emphasize it one more time. So you have a low blood sugar. Sometimes we get a call from an outside institution, and they say, oh, the blood sugar was 40, and we checked the cortisol, we checked the insulin, and insulin is normal. It's in normal range. Then uh, we say, what was the actual problem? So technically, it should be suppressed. It should be unmeasurable uh, in the presence of a low blood sugar. So we, uh, we want to know. Uh, the exact values and uh, interpret them well. Thank you very much. Great. All right. Well, I think in the interest of time, we need to close. But uh, yeah. All right. Thank you very much.